are you familiar at all with with uh with Penrose's use of of girdle um in the philosophy of mind yeah that well it starts with uh, lucas right? that's right so the, the, yeah. the luc the lucas argument is that um in a in a nutshell the girdle sentence can't be proven by the system but me, a human, can recognize that it's true. Indeed, I can kind of prove that it's true because I can run through the options, right? It, it says that it's not provable. So if it said what it says is the case, then indeed it's not provable. And if it's what it says is false, you know, so you can run through this line of argument and convince yourself that it's, in fact, the Gödel sentence is true but not provable. And so Lucas floated this idea that, well, there's something that a human can do that a formal system can't do. Mm -hmm. So for this idea that, that uh, a human is just some sort of fancy computing device, right? Yeah. Um, and this was back in the 60s, right? When computing was pretty primitive. I mean, most of our, you know, most of our laptops are more powerful than <laughs> most, most machines that people were playing around with. Yeah. And so it was a very early sort of thought about compute, you know, com the mind just being some sort of machine. And it was thought that, okay, here's something that a human can do, pro properly trained human, not anyone recognizes the truth of the Gödel sentence, but it's not too hard. You can get, you know, any undergraduate to see that it's true. Then here's something that a human can do that a, a machine can't. And so, you know, in a slogan, the mind is not a machine. Is yeah. the, the thought of Lucas. Penrose takes that a lot further with, you know, adding stuff about quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. But the, the basic idea f that arises from the Gödel's theorem is that, you know, there's, there's some kind of difference between uh, the human mind and a machine. Yeah. No, I think that's wrong. I think that's just straightforwardly wrong. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's what I was going for. Yeah. I wanted to get your, not, your opinion on that. And not to say that the, the, the mind is a machine, but rather that line of argument for why it isn't doesn't work, right? Yeah. So, for instance, it's very easy to get the, the Gödel sentence recognized, just have another system that has that Gödel sentence added as an axiom. Right now mm -hmm. it's provable because it's an axiom, right? Okay. But that system will have its own Gödel sentence, another Gödel sentence. So the, the, the theorem says for any system of a suitable kind that's, that's consistent, and is rich enough to formulate basic arithmetic, will have a Gödel sentence. Now, the fact that I can recognize the the first Gödel sentence doesn't mean that I haven't got my own Gödel sentence. Right, right. Yeah, I might have mine, but I can't recognize my own. Yeah. I could recognize someone else's. That's fine. So there's nothing that says I can't recognize yours and you can't that you can't recognize mine. That's fine. What you can't do is recognize that you that prove your own Gödel sentence. So the that, that's the self-reference. That's the whole point of it. Yeah. yeah, so the first first the problem with this line of thought, I mean, it's an interesting line of thought. I don't, I don't mean to, to, sure, sure. Of, you know, to, to to condemn it. I think it's actually really kind of fascinating sort of thought to throw up when you sort of see the Gödel. It's very natural. When you first see Gödel's incompleteness theorem, you think, wow, all of mathematics, no matter what they do, they can't prove that. I can see it, you know. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's something special about me. It's a very natural kind of thought. But... You know what this the all the, the theorem says is that the system cannot prove its own Gödel sentence. Now, nothing in Lucas or Penrose shows that you don't have your own Gödel sentence that you can't prove. That's the second thing to say is that it has to be formulated in a certain kind of way and it has to be consistent. Who ever thought that a human mind is consistent, mm. right? I mean, huh. that's a really strong requirement. I mean, just think about your own beliefs about stuff. Um, yeah. You have kind of inconsistent beliefs, maybe compartmentalized. You know, I, I believe some facts about geography of my own city, just roughly which streets run, this is an example of David Lewis's, I think, roughly which streets run north, south, east, west when you're in that particular part of the city. And then another part of the city, you have other beliefs about which streets run northwest. And then in the overlap, you find because you're approximating, you've got inconsistent beliefs about the direction of a particular street. Yeah. Right? That's very, very common to have those kinds of inconsistencies. And the fact that they're compartmentalized, neither here nor there, your overall belief systems 
are surely inconsistent. Um, it would be a miracle if we all had perfectly consistent beliefs, right? Yeah. So again, you know, the fact that you can recognize a girdle sentence in another system um, from another system which is inconsistent, it's also about deductive systems. We work probabilistically as well. We have yeah, sure. I mean, so there's big, there are some differences between this kind of formal system and the human mind, but it's not, you know, I, I think there are better explanations for it than there being something very special about the, the human mind. Um, yeah. That's, that's, those are such good points. Um, I got to chew on those some more. That I really, really like that. I, especially the, yeah, the girdle sentence recognizing someone else's. That makes so much sense. And yeah, we're not consistent. Wow. Okay. I'm going to try not I mean, to get too hung up. Yeah. So you can, you know, for instance, you can just build a series of systems. You have a, a, a system that can't prove, you know, the, the system Girdle had in mind with the Girdle sentence, this sentence is not provable. Then just add that as an axiom to the next system. Now I can recognize that as, a, as it's, you know, as a theorem because, you know, simple proof from axiom to theorem, you just promote it. But we'll have another Girdle sentence. And add that to another system, and then you get another system that has another girdle, and you know, so you end up with this series of systems, each recognizing the girdle sentence of the previous one, but not of its own. Yeah. And what now I'm not saying that that is in fact what's going on with the you know the fault in the Lucas argument, but it's not excluded. Yeah. Lucas gives nothing to suggest that, okay. We've got our own girdle sentences, and so we're just like the machine. We've got our own girdle sentence. We don't know what it is, but just because we can see someone else's doesn't mean that we don't have our own. Right. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, um, that's I, I just believe. Not excluded by the line of argument. Right. 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 I think that um, I believe that's Michael Glansberg's approach to holding on to classical logic in light of the the liar paradox, and he says, "Well, we just move out." We move out, and each time we consider it, we have to move out another level. But it's this is a similar type of thing. That's really fascinating. Um, and and he's dealing with the liar paradox, and we're dealing with this uh, girdle sentence, which has the same self-reference, which is really fun and crazy to think about. Man, that's so cool. Uh, 